My name is Michael Williamson, and this is my incredible wife, Michelle. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for tuning in and worshiping with us online today. Jane and I'm from London. Hi, I'm Frankie and I'm from Devon. Hi, I'm Rachel and I'm also from London. And we want to invite you to the London, London International, International Christian Church. Can I tell you what? God is reigning right now. We're going to reign with him someday in heaven. If you want to check us out, head to www.londonchurch.org.uk Welcome to the London International Christian Church. I'm glad you guys can worship with us once again this morning. My name is Paul. We have Josie singing soprano, Hilary singing alto, Joseph and Tenor, the Medellin on bass, Luke on keys, and David playing the cajon. We're going to sing Let It Rise. Let the Spirit of the Lord rise among us. Let the Spirit of the Lord Better let it rise among us. Let the praises of our King. Lord God Almighty. Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord God Almighty. I'm gonna sing, sing, sing for you. Gonna sing, sing, sing for you. Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord God Almighty. I'm gonna sing, sing, sing for you. Gonna sing, sing, sing for you. I'm gonna work uh -huh. and bring. And sing every day, gonna work uh -huh. and pray right. and sing every day. Lord God Almighty, oh Lord God Almighty, I'm gonna go baptize for you. I'm gonna go baptize for you, Lord God Almighty, oh Lord God Almighty, I'm gonna go baptize for you. I'm gonna go baptize for you, I'm gonna work uh -huh. and pray right. baptize every day, gonna work uh -huh. and pray. Baptize every day. I don't know 
know what you came to do. I don't know what you came to do. I don't know what you came to do. I don't know what you came to do. I came to clap my hands. 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 Singing, I don't know. I don't know what you came to do. What you came to do. I don't know. I don't know what you come to do. What you came to do. I don't know. I don't know what you came to do. What you came to do. I don't know. I don't know what you came to do. What you came to do. I came to clap my hands. I came to clap my hands. I came to clap my hands, 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 I came to clap my hands. Wade in the water. Wade in the water. Wade in the water, children. Wade in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Now see those people dressed in red. God's gonna trouble the water. They Moses led. God's gonna trouble the water. Now see those people dressed in gold. God's gonna trouble the water. They look like disciples of Christ I'm told. God's gonna trouble the water. No, you got to wait.
Hello and good morning. My name is Colby and this is my darling wife, Rebecca, and we want to welcome you to our virtual Sunday service. The Bible says in Psalm 66, shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down before you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. And as I just read this this morning, I was just so inspired thinking about our God that we serve, that our God is an awesome God. I think it's so amazing that it's coming into the summertime. It's sunny, great weather. You get to be out in just God's creation. And it just fires me up. And I, I felt convicted as I read this because I don't spend enough time praising God. I don't just go out and just shout for joy. I think so often I'm so focused on me and my life that I, it's, it's so important to be able to, just, to focus on God and to focus on praising God and giving him the glory that he deserves. So I'm going to hand over to you, babe. What do you think? Yes. Yeah, I love the scripture that you chose because it says, how awesome are your deeds, so great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. <laughs> and I love this because Moses and Miriam, it's actually the same word that they use in Exodus 15, 11, when they talk about God freeing them from Egypt, from slavery in Egypt. And they say, who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders. And they saw something that had never been done before. They had been in slavery for 400 years. But when God brought them out, they saw how awesome God's deeds were, how different he was from any other God. And I love that because we serve a God that allows us to do things that have never been done before. So I want to encourage you, if you're watching today, and you are watching today, to really believe this scripture that God is awesome. We have a God that will do things in your life that has never been done before. Amazing. So I want to get a little interactive here. So I want you at home to stand up and on the count of three, we're going to give God a shout for joy. You ready, babe? Yes. <laughs> awesome. So one, two, three. Yeah! Yay! And with that, we want to welcome you to the London International Christian Church. My name is Paul Busari. I currently lead the Arts, Media and Sports Ministry here in London. I have the privilege to, to pray. Let's close our eyes. Heavenly Father God, I am so encouraged, Heavenly Father, to be here uh, with my brothers and sisters virtually online. Uh, it's such an incredible privilege to know, Lord, that you've allowed us to, to stay at home, Heavenly Father, Lord, and to focus in on you. I'm so inspired, Heavenly Father, Lord, by what you're doing all around the world, all of the souls that's coming to know you because of COVID-19. I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you really move and you, you help us forcefully advance your kingdom during this time. I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you can draw to us, Heavenly Father, men and women, God, who are seeking revival. Men and women, Heavenly Father, who desire to, to change their lives, but they don't know how. I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that people who are looking to take their lives, they come to us, Heavenly Father, Lord. That we could be a beacon of light for those, Heavenly Father, who don't know what to do and where to go. And I pray, Heavenly Father, we can help them find a place where they belong, your kingdom. I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you really be of our special missions contribution coming up very shortly, God. I pray, Lord, that we can raise the money to send out mission teams to all of the nations around the world, specifically here in Europe, God. I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, for uh, our Amsterdam planting, Heavenly Father, we sent out last year, God, the way it's flourishing, it's, it's so inspiring to see how you're moving, God. I pray, Heavenly Father, we can send churches to, to Rome. I pray, Heavenly Father, we can send churches to Bucharest and Budapest, God. I pray, Lord, that we can send churches to Edinburgh even yet this year, God. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we can raise the funds, God. You are the Lord of the harvest, God. You have all the gold and all the silver. Please release these funds to us, Heavenly Father. I pray, Lord, that you, you move in a powerful way, God. I thank you so much for protecting us during this time. Uh, those, Heavenly Father, who have contracted the disease, God, they've, they've been healed, Heavenly Father, and they're safe. I thank you so much, Heavenly Father, for all of the ways that you're moving. I pray you be with us in a powerful way. Please be with today's service, God. Be with the lesson, God. I pray it hits our heart in a powerful way. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning! My name is Victoria, this is Kiki, this is Rachel, together we're the Sisters of Encouragement and we're here to bring you the announcements. For our church, 
The last command is the first priority. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus tells us to go and make disciples of all nations. If we're going to be a going church for a coming Christ, we need to be game changers and know the elementary truths of God's word. I say all this to say, first principles classes continue today at 2 p.m. with the kingdom study. You know, last week we were spared a pop quiz and I don't think we'll be so lucky today. And so if you haven't studied, please get to it right now. You know, now that we're in teams, the competition is really hotting up. We're going to be performing our team songs today as well. Shout out some warriors. You know who you are. <laughs> uh, this evening at 7 p.m., we're going to be having our Bible talk leaders meeting. You know, in Acts chapter, uh, in Acts chapter 5, the the the, 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 the the Bible talks about how um, the Bible talks about how the church is built from house to house, you know, and Bible talks, especially now that we're in the coronavirus and COVID-19, all the Bible talks are taking place at home. If you're interested in joining a Bible talk, check out the, uh, the emails in the link below. Shoot us a message. We'd love to have you. Thanks to Victoria. Last Sunday, we saw from Acts 8 and 9 that the first century church was built through game-changing baptism. And as a church from the 21st century, the church of God in the 21st century, we are made of game-changing baptism. Victoria was a game-changing baptism. Rachel was a game-changing baptism. And by the grace of God, I was a game-changing baptism. And all the disciples who have been baptized in the church are game-changers. In Jeremiah 1, 5, God says that he formed us in the womb. He says that he knew us and approved of us as his chosen instrument. Jeremiah was a, no, a young prophet, sorry. He was a young prophet, and there we say he was a campus student. And he was called by God to change the course of history, yeah. as was Haggai. He was an older prophet, but he was called by God to rebuild the temple after the exile. If you were called by God, you are a game changer. And so this coming Friday, we're going to have our campus devotional because as students, we believe that we are called to change the world for Jesus. And so if you're a student and you want to join us, come at 7 p.m. to go and be game changers for Jesus. This coming Wednesday, though, we are going to have our men's midweek. <laughs> Thank you, brothers. If you're um, a man, if you're young or mature, and, and if you're extrovert or introvert, actually, no, because there's no such thing as this in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So if you're a man and you want to join us or join the brother, actually, at 7 p.m. this Wednesday, just speak, check the description down below. And to God, actually, I'm going to leave my friend Rachel speak. <laughs> Thank you, Kiki, for those announcements. So just under, uh, just under a month, we'll be having the deadline of our special missions contribution. The Bible teaches us in 1 Chronicles 29 that everything we get is from God himself, including our money, guys, believe it or not. And giving is important to us. Ultimately, it shows our gratitude to God in all that he's done in each and every one of our lives. And the money we raise for the special missions will actually go out to help plant churches all over across Europe, specifically, yeah, just here in the, in the European world sector. And yes, it's what's even greater is that right now we have raised over 60%, 60% of our goal, and which is incredible. It's like, thank you so much to everyone that has given so far, but just keep going, guys. Just keep pushing us the last, last leg, and we can do this totally. And so if that's been put in your heart to give, you can check out the link right over here, and you can click donate to give us, to give, yeah, to give online. Also, since you're already here, why not subscribe to our YouTube channel? You can you just click it down here. You can also hit that notification bell so you can stay updated with our um, yeah with our videos. Also, give us a thumbs up and also leave a comment below too. If you want any more details about the announcements, you can check out the description below. And to God be all the glory. Hi everyone, my name is Taff. I give you good news from San Francisco and Mexico. 
San Francisco is just on fire with 20 new men and women coming to the faith, two of which have been teens from teens ministry. Saul and Annie have really just said yes to the call of becoming disciples. Even Mexico as well with our brother Carlitos, who's also a teen. At 17, he's answered the call to, yes, become the cyber ministry evangelist. This is just amazing how the teens ministry is on fire at the moment for God. Thank you, Taf. Good morning, church. My name is Sulo, and I bring you good news from India and Nepal. And this fires me up so much because I'm Nepali. And to know that God is going after my nation, saving my people through His grace, encourages my soul so, so, so much. It reminds me of a scripture in Acts chapter 4 and chapter 5 where it talks about the apostles, the disciples of, uh, of Jesus Christ, fearlessly preaching the gospel, fearlessly preaching the word, just like our brothers and sisters in India. Through their perseverance and their faith, it has resulted in 14 baptisms and one restoration. Wow, Sula, that's awesome. My name is Shani, and I bring you good news from the UK. So there's a young man named Wellington. He was met four years ago in Birmingham by Sean when he was sent out to plant the Birmingham church. He was met a second time by Frank when he went to Birmingham, and he was met a third time by Luke when Luke was sent out to Birmingham to plant the church. A month ago, Wellington finally decided to study the Bible and he got baptized. And the girlfriend that he had to break up with in order to become a disciple, Jessica, also got baptized. Jessica's little brother, Antonio, also got baptized. And in his repentance, Antonio texted all of his friends, telling them that he was becoming a disciple. And now his friends are studying the Bible and soon to be baptized. We are a church that goes after multiplication, not addition. And we believe in making disciples of all nations. And just like how the first century church did it, that means we can do it too. And to God be all the glory. This is an AMS original titled Enough.
I need your love. One, two, three. Oh, I need your love in this shadow place. I can't get enough of your sunlight on my face when it's cold and dark. Or Planted by a stream First for a drink Of your love I can't face a day Without some time to pray I sing this song to say I need your love I'm a tiny child But when I'm with you I will not grow tired Cause there's nothing you can do Your love makes me strong Though I'm small and weak and the whole day long You'll speak through me when I speak And just like a tree Planted by a stream Thirsty for a drink Of your love I can face a day Without some time to pray I sing this song to say I need your love You gave all for me Though I cursed your name On that bitter tree Lord, you suffered for my shame how can I thank you? Your love paid my way. All that I can do is live for you every day. And just like a tree planted by a stream, thirsty for a dream, of your love I can face a day without some time to pray I sing this song to say I need your Hello, uh, so now is the time in our service where we speak about the cross and what the cross means to us. And I have the privilege of introducing someone's very special to us in the West region, and that is Chanel. So Chanel was baptized over a year ago, and when she came and joined the West, she was just such a ray of sunshine. She's such a constant source of encouragement to all of us with her bubbly personality and uh, constant energy. And so it's a great privilege to be able to introduce her to share about the communion. The scripture she's asked me to read is found in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 10. It says, the name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. I give you Chanel. Thank you, Colby. Okay. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Chanel. Um, I'm a student. Uh, I've just finished my undergrad in human biology. Um, through God's grace, I'll be studying at Imperial to do my master's in neuroscience. Um, and it's honestly a great honor to be able to share what the cross means to me today. Um, and if I could sum it up in one word, I'd say the cross means to me uh, refuge. 
Um, I'd say this really appropriately describes my relationship with God um, because I always find myself running back and forth into his arms, even by accident, constantly falling into his refuge. Um, so honestly, in my life, like I've really had difficulties having relationships with females. Um, I was uh, an only child growing up. I grew up in like army barracks. And so when I went to school, I just felt really misunderstood. And I felt like no one really understood like my personality or who I was. And I just feel like um, no one really understood me. And I would just constantly compare myself to other women. It was always women that I felt like just didn't get me and I always get judged by them. And so much so that at the age of 14, I, um, I was almost hospitalized uh, for anorexia nervosa. And that really took a toll on my life. Um, and things were at the worst they could have ever been for me. Um, and despite being this like really happily and like bubbly person and really positive person, um, I just feel like everyone saw that as completely fake because they, I just was dealing with all these like turbulent thoughts in my head and I was just completely at battle in my mind. And it just led to so many people in my lifetime just completely judging me and women just thought I was fake, just judge, like completely just bullying me passively up front. And I just wanted to just basically run away. Um, and then I thought like I could just run away to university. And I think it would all like change when I went there because everyone was older, they grew up. So I, I ran to university thinking it would all just change, but actually it kind of stuck uh, with me. Um, and then when I went to university, I had these amazing female friends. Like first year was amazing. We really stuck together, they were incredible. And then the next following year, I just felt completely betrayed by them. Like it completely went sour. Um, I felt really manipulated. I felt depressed. I felt like I couldn't run, I couldn't be me anymore. Like it really stopped me being who I actually was. Um, and I remember one, one day, like they made a group chat with me and my boyfriend at the time. And they basically said all these things. Um, and they said it in the chat while I was in a lecture once. And I just remember running out crying and he saw it, everyone saw it. And it was all just about me. And I just didn't know what was going on. And um, I just completely lost myself and I couldn't find it even through my education, even though it was the one thing that was keeping me sane. Um, but instead of addressing it, I completely avoided it, which made it so much worse. And the girls just hated me more for it really. Um, and I thought uni could be my refuge, just everything, but it, I was just gravely mistaken. It was never my refuge at the time. And so um, I just remember it, just thinking of that dreaded thought of having to live there another year and I just couldn't I couldn't handle it so I just decided like there's only one thing I could do and that was just to run away so I remember like just applying to go study in California just completely on the other half of the world I just wanted to get as far away as possible I love to avoid my problems I love to run away every single second and so I did I got the place I went to California I was running away God knew I was running away and I think he was trying to like <laughs> land pad me like in his arms over there because that was the time where actually I started to regain everything back again like I started getting better at my grades I, I was in you know I was competing in tournaments around California I was doing everything I could have possibly ever wanted but God hit me at that point in my life because I think he wanted to get me before I regressed again before the recycle like the cycle repeated itself all over again because I knew it would have just happened when I got back um and then I was studying the Bible and this has changed my life like little by little, like completely changing everything I thought about my happiness, like what it actually was. Because everything I did seek, like I just, like, if I lost that one thing, it, I wouldn't have been happy. Like I would have keep being sad, happy, sad, just going in this flux. And um, I just remember uh, I was just reluctant to go back to Oxford again. So I went back to Oxford and I was still struggling to, deal with how I feel about how women felt about me and it was a massive thing for me still I was so anxious and yeah we had Christians in Oxford it was amazing and I had my friend Kiki and we have Coral they are incredible women but I was still living independently in my own household and it was still my opportunity to keep running away um, and I just remember like since this COVID-19 that is really recent for me a couple of months ago when it happened I realized like I would have either been stuck in a house where I could keep running away, <clears throat> but it would have been spiritual suicide for me because I would 
easily be able to ignore everything, just completely ignore those problems. So I decided that, you know, this time um, I'm just going to trust God. I'm just going to trust God with this plan. And so I went to go live with a Christian household with these women. And I remember the first time I got there, we had a household meeting and I was just struggling to hold back the tears. Like I was literally so emotional. I remember like sitting in the back with all the women at the front and I think they could see it deep down and they were just looking at me and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm going to burst out in tears. I was full of paranoia, anxiety. I just wanted to crash. I was like, here we go again. It's going to happen all over again. God, why would you put me in this position? I was so angry. I was so upset. I was so emotional. It just all came out. And their response to it was just in incredible. Like I never thought they would welcome me still like this. And um this was honestly my worst nightmare. <laughs> my issues with women were being dealt with up front because of this virus. But I realized I couldn't keep running to everything except God anymore. And um, he's always going to be my final destination. That's why I had to just cope with it. I had to stay because little did they know I was actually planning my escape. I really just wanted to run away. I was like, I'm just going back to Oxford soon. I'm going to keep going back. Like I was planning it. I was running again. And he knew exactly what I was doing. But now I live with eight women from all different backgrounds. Like, I kid you not, from all different walks of life. And let me just tell you, these women are from like China, America, uh, Trinidad, Nigeria, the Philippines, Britain, France, Romania. And we have eight women of all different walks of life living in a three bedroom house with one bathroom. If that isn't unity, I don't know what is because there's no way that could unify us, especially with one bathroom with all these women. And like, when I realized that actually um, Christ's death was the only thing that compelled every single woman to die to themselves so that we could actually be completely unified together. And this absolute unity doesn't come from anything but the same purpose, but the same goal, but the same death. Like these women understood what it took to not have to be themselves so we could be together. And God is just showing me that, you know, he can use these women to show me that he already won over this area of my life and he's just completely changing it. I'm still anxious all the time, but I'm seeing the fruit in, in Christ's death because of it. Um, but yeah, I just, just want to share that I constantly run from things. I constantly run from women and I always end up in the hands of God to always show me that I never have to keep running. I just have to keep running to his refuge, always have to keep running into his hands. Um, and yeah, so the cross to me is just a place of refuge and a place to run to. And thank you guys for listening. Let us pray for the communion. Father, thank you so much that you are a safe place for us. God, when we look at the world, the world is such a dangerous place. So, so much uh, uncertainty, mm -hmm. so much that we, we can be afraid of, of hurt and harm. And uh, God, I'm just so grateful that you are that safe place for us. You are that refuge, that fortified tower that we can go, we can run to you. I thank you that we don't have to run away from our problems, that we can run to you and that you can give us the strength to overcome the challenges that we have. You can give us the healing that we need to overcome the injuries that we've gone through in life, God. I just thank you so much. Thank you so much for your love. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for us and that through his death, we can be totally unified, just as Chanel said. So Father, I just thank you so much. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven? A constant friend is he, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me, his eye is on the sparrow, 
Chris Worth, and I have the honor of giving you the contribution charge for today. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. If I was to entitle my contribution today, it would be entitled Sacrificial Worship. From verse 1, it says this Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship now i know at home you're wondering what the greek is for sacrifice it comes from the greek word thysia meaning to sacrifice no matter how you try to spin it sacrifice in god's eyes is still sacrifice therefore sacrifice in our eyes can't be anything but sacrifice in the old covenant if you didn't sacrifice to god then you didn't worship god God doesn't change as we've just seen. So if you don't sacrifice now in the new covenant, then you still don't worship God. God believes in one type of worship, sacrificial worship. Special missions is coming up and we're currently over 60% to our 91,000 pound goal. Now our goal isn't really to achieve the goal, but to exceed it. For those who are new, Special missions is where the church raises, uh, raises a large sum of money to plant an upcoming church. This year, it's Scotland. Thank you so much to everyone who has already raised and has already given their missions. You have shown your heart to be one of true and proper worship to God. But don't stop there. Raise more. Sacrifice more. If you haven't given, but you have a plan, stay true to your plan. Talk to your discipler and continue working on your sacrifice to God. But if you're a member of the church, and you haven't given anything, and, and you have no plan, then, then ask yourself, where are you really at now? Are you really here to worship God? Or do you just come to enjoy the singing? I mean, the singing is great, don't get me wrong. But I come to worship God. We know that money is attached to the heart, so if you really want to worship God, then give. It's not an option in God's eyes. No sacrifice is no worship. In the Old Testament, it was the shedding of animals' blood. It was the animal's heart that got sacrificed at the altar. But God wanted a different sacrifice. So he sacrificed himself so that now we no longer sacrifice with the life source of animals, but rather with our own hearts. God wants you to sacrifice with your heart and no longer with something or, yeah, and no longer is something else's heart. We need to sacrifice. Some people say, well, I just don't believe on giving on Sundays. Well, do you believe in worshipping in God? In 50 AD, when Paul was in the full-time ministry, he planted five churches in one year, between Acts 16 and Acts 18. But in 51 AD, when he had to work as a tent maker in Corinth, due to a not... Uh, uh, due to not enough money to support him in the full-time ministry, he didn't plant a single church for a year and a half. Money helps advance God's kingdom. Do you want to be responsible for the movement or for the slowing of God's advancing kingdom? Even though your money cannot stop God, the lack of heart and worship can slow the progress. And that's what happened with Paul the Apostle. 
How many people do you want to be saved? Do you have a vision for Europe? Do you have a vision for the evangelization and even more the salvation of millions across the world? In verse 2, it says, after being the living sacrifice, we need to sacrifice everything in our lives as well. Then we'll be able to test what God's will is. Without sacrifice, you can't test what God's will is for your life. You have no vision. You have been blinded by your lack of sacrifice. God will evangelize the world no matter what happens. God's kingdom will advance no matter what happens. But only with those true living sacrifices, the true worshippers of God. I'll close with this question. Do you want to be a part of God's movement? If you've liked what you heard and God has put it on your heart to give, then please click on the link in the description below. And please give generously to God's modern day movement. Please bow your heads for the prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that we can sacrifice to you. That we can be true worshippers of you, Father. That we can show our worship through sacrifice as you showed your love through sacrifice to us, Father. I pray for the evangelization of Europe. I pray that the money raised today can just go out, can save souls, Father, can go to those crying out to you, Father. I thank you so much for the contribution. I love you. It's through Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We present you with an AMS original, The Name of Jesus. The plan of God before creation The death of Christ and resurrection He sacrificed for our redemption The blood he shed for our salvation And we confess and declare that He is our Savior, the Lord of our lives, the King our Creator Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, our Father and our friend. We give you the glory, for you are worthy. The whole world should know the name, the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus, the name of Jesus. There is power in the name. The name of Jesus we proclaim. To break free all our chains. And to find purpose in our pain And we confess and declare that He is our Savior The Lord of our lives The King, our Creator Alpha and Omega Beginning and the end Our Savior and our friend We give you the glory For you are worthy the whole world should know the name, the name of Jesus. We give you the glory, for you are worthy. The whole world should know the name, the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus, 
the name of Jesus. You are the line of the world. You are, yeah, the Emmanuel. You are, yeah, the one we beheld. You're our father and our friend. You are, yeah, Emmanuel. You are, yeah, the light of the world. You are, yeah. The one we beheld, you're our father and our friend. We give you the glory, for you are worthy. The whole world should know the name, the name of Jesus. Oh, we give you the glory, for you are worthy. The whole world should know the name, the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus. We're going to sing, Rise Up, O Men of God. One, two, three. Rise up, O men of God, have done with lesser things. Give heart and mind and soul and strength to serve the King of kings. Rise up, O men of God, his kingdom tarries long. Bring in the day of brotherhood and end the night of wrong. Rise up, O men of God, the church for you doth wait. Her strength unequal to her test, rise up and make her great. Lift high the cross of Christ, tread where his feet have trod. As brothers of the Son of Man, rise up, O men of God, rise up. Rise up, O oh men of God. It is time for us to rise up. Be turning in your Bibles to the book of Acts in chapter 11. Uh, the title of the lesson today is very simple. We serve a missionary God. We serve not a, dare we say, a stationary God, but a missionary God. So we can't just take our Christianity and be stationary. We've got to be like our God in heaven and have a visionary, a missionary mindset. In Psalms chapter 96, verse 3, the Bible says, Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among some people. No, all people. God wants his glory declared amongst all people. And I love this incredible, incredible promise because he desires for all people and all nations to worship him. Dare we say God is... God is the author of all missionary activity. You go through the Old Testament. You look at Abraham. He was called to be a missionary. You look at Moses. He was called to leave the comforts of his home, be a missionary. You look at the Psalms, and it's so much about the world and all nations knowing his glory. You look at the prophets, and, and, and you look at the first century disciples, and yet we come to a time where we look at God's church, a missionary church, because we serve a missionary God. You know, I am so encouraged. I pray that you've been going over our series in the book of Acts 
course, Luke is the writer of the book of Acts. And last week, we talked about game-changing baptisms. We highlighted that there were three converts in the New Testament, specifically the book of Acts, that changed the game for world evangelism. Because the gospel had already gone to Jerusalem, but the disciples hadn't scattered. But when those three game-changing baptisms happened, the world was evangelized. You say, which ones were they? Of course, they were the Ethiopian eunuch, Paul the Apostle, and Cornelius. When Noah and all of his people came out of the ark after the flood, the Bible says that they were divided amongst three, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem, Ham, and Japheth represented all the descendants of the world. And so we see these three game-changing converts from Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We see from Ham, the Ethiopian eunuch. We see from Shem, Paul the apostle, which would be Asia. And the descendant from Japheth would be the Gentile, Cornelius. And that would be the gospel throughout all of Europe. God has always been a missionary God, wanting the, the gospel to go all around the world. I'm so impressed with the church and be praying. We have a young lady by the name of Beatrice who's very close to being baptized. Uh, we have another young lady by the name of Esther who wants to be, dare we say, a missionary. She's close to being baptized. We have a young man that we want to put the strength and the faith and that spiritual toughness inside of him so he can be truly lucky. His name is Lucky, and we're praying that he can be baptized. We have a young man by the name of Shane. He's a bit outside of London in Wales, but we know that God wants Wales evangelized. We're praying for Shane. We're praying for Ricardo, but today... Tony has come to be baptized. Emil from the Philippines has come to be baptized. And Lisa from Vietnam wants to be a missionary. She's come to be baptized. I hope you are in Acts chapter 10. Of course, we take off from Cornelius. And of course, Cornelius was the last baptism. But what's interesting is it says, so they ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. You know, it's so awesome when someone gets baptized, they learn what it means to be a true disciple, a Christian, but then they ask the person that baptized them to be taught much more. See, Cornelius was a game changer because he didn't just stop learning the gospel and stop learning at baptism. He says, hey, Paul, can, Peter, can you stay here with me and teach me how to be a Bible talk leader? Can you teach me how to preach? Can you teach me how to lead studies? Can you teach me how? Can I have your, can I, can I raise on up? I'm so proud of the church. And if you have been baptized, I pray you have that spirit because God not only desires game-changing baptisms, but God is a missionary God. You know, it's so interesting with COVID-19. They say that, well, you know, COVID-19 has caused such a challenge. It's closed every church. But I believe God is, is a visionary God. He's a missionary God. And God is saying, hey, I haven't closed every church. I've opened every single church in homes. So I've opened up much more churches right now instead of closing them. Down. I just pray you have faith in the time of coronavirus. I pray you believe that God hasn't closed churches. He's opened them on up. He's opened home after home after home so that God's message can get on out there. And yet we come to the time where the gospel, or, or at least the book of Acts, goes into detail about, of course, our brother Peter. And Peter says here in, in Acts chapter 11, it says, The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard the Gentiles also have received the word of of God. And so Peter begins to explaining everything to them. Peter begins saying, hey, I know I'm a Jew, but the Gentiles now receive the gospel. And of course, this is roughly about 40 AD. You know, Peter had been a Christian for roughly about 13 years because he was one of the first ones that Jesus called. And 13 years into his Christianity, God called him to embrace change. <laughs> theological change, deep change. He had to change that edge he had towards the Gentiles because God said the Gentiles are now saved. And so Pete, we find that Peter had to do something in his Christianity that many of us have to do. We've got to embrace change. And yet there's kind of three responses to change. You either resist change, you run from change, or you embrace change. And yet Peter embraces the change. He, he encourages the brothers that the Gentiles have now received salvation. He backs up his, his message by showing fruit, because it says in verse 9, the voice spoke from heaven a second time. Don't call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was pulled up to, into heaven again. Uh, it says, right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. Spirit told me to have no hesitation, 
about going with them. These six brothers also went with me. He took six brothers, there it is. And we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in a house and say, send to Joppa for Simon, who's called Peter. He'll bring you a message through whom, which all you and your household will be saved. And everybody gets saved right there. But our, our, our first thing we learn here is that Peter was teachable. Peter was teachable. Late in life. <laughs> and dare we say, when you're unteachable, you're unreachable. God can't reach your heart with his mission when you're unreachable. You know, I, I, I love this because Peter allowed himself to be taught. And we know what Proverbs says. It says in Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 7, it says, whoever rebukes a wicked man and cures abuse, do not rebuke a mocker or he'll hate you. <laughs> rebuke a wise man and he will love you. You always got to ask yourself, are you teachable? <laughs> in Proverbs 23 verse 9, says, don't speak to a fool, for he'll scorn the wisdom of your words. Wow. He says, if someone scorns the word of God, they are a fool. The only help for them is jail. You know, jail is for the people that don't want to listen to authority. <laughs> they get forced to sit in jail to think about the consequences of their life. And yet we can be in the spiritual jail when we are unteachable. I believe coronavirus is teaching all of us a great lesson about the sovereignty of God. But I also believe that God is trying to get his message into our homes. He is still trying to evangelize us. He's still trying to get all the Gentiles out there. And I believe that once you stop learning, you stop leading. God has been teaching me quite a bit. Not always does the teaching feel good. But God has been teaching me a lot about my pride, teaching me a lot about my, 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 my understanding of the word. I've been digging into the word of God, just trying to be teachable at this time. Of course, it reminds me of the story of the angry little bird that went to fly south for the winter. I pray you're not just kind of a, a little angry bird with the coronavirus. <laughs> but as this little angry bird flies south for the winter, he, he's complaining the entire way. He's so angry because uh, he's got to fly south. Uh, he's, 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 he's saying to himself, what's God done here? I feel, feel so comfortable in my little nest. Now i got to fly south. It's freezing cold. And, of course, not only is it freezing cold, it starts to get cold while he's complaining. So much so that he gets frozen and he falls to the ground in a huge field. He's sitting there and he's ticked off now. He's fr his wings are frozen. He's lying there. And right as he starts to freeze on over, a big cow comes on over and <laughs> drops, you know what, right on his head. <laughs> drops another one right on his, on his head. Cow dung. And, and he just is sitting there, and he just so, and, but he realizes that it's, it's, it's quite warm. <laughs> and, his, and, his, and his little frozen wings just start to move right there. And, 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 and he starts to feel, wow, maybe, maybe this wasn't so bad. He, gets, he starts to get very warm and, and happy, and, and he's got the ability to now fly away. And, and instead, he, instead of flying, he gets so happy, he just starts chirping and kind of chirp, 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 chirp. So a cat hears him, comes, digs him out, and eats him. Yeah, that's, that's the story. That's the story. You say, well, what's the moral of the story, bro? Not everybody who drops mess on you is the enemy. Not everybody who digs you out is your friend. And even when you're in deep mess, learn the lesson, leave the mess, keep your trap shut, and keep learning right there. <laughs> I, I pray you're learning during this time, specifically you disciples. You still are learning the word of God. You still are preparing yourself to be that missionary, your dream, your scheme. You're trying to figure out where does God want to send me? Point number one, God does what's, ordinary, what's extraordinary when people do what is ordinary. God does what's extraordinary when people do what's ordinary. Let's pick it up in chapter 12. It's about 43 AD. Of course, in 42 AD, the disciples get called Christians first at Antioch, the very first time the word Christian Jews. And then we pick it up in 44 AD in chapter 12 of Acts. It says it was about this time that King Herod had arrested some who belonged to the church. Intending to persecute them, he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. I mean, this is discouraging. <laughs> Jesus has died. Stephen has died. And now you have the first apostle who dies. 
And the Bible says, when he saw this, he saw that this pleased the Jews. He proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison. And he went over to be, to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers. That's roughly about 16 guys. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. I mean, here's this political guy trying to keep, quote, unquote, the law and trying to please the people right there. It says in verse 5, so Peter was kept in prison. But the church was earnestly praying to God for him. I mean, this is intense. Peter goes to jail. Knowing an apostle just got killed. And the Bible says the church was praying for him. See, God does what's extraordinary when his people do what's ordinary. And so the people are, are praying for the leaders. I pray you're praying for me. And they're praying for him. And the Bible just says, the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. Just sleeping. He's sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains and two sentries guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in his cell. He struck Peter on the side, woke him, get up, he said, and a change fell off his wrist. Then the angel said to him, put, your clothes in your, put on your clothes and your sandals. He was naked. <laughs> and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around and follow me. The angel told him. Peter followed him out of prison. But he had no idea that it was an angel. What was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guard, came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the open, when they walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him, and the church said, Amen. I mean, this is extraordinary. Peter gets out of this situation, and you see that God can get you out of situations when you turn to him. I really believe the only true power the powerless possess is the power of prayer. Right here, Peter is powerless, but not really. He's got the power of prayer. You may believe you are powerless, but the only power the true powerless possess is the power of prayer. We've got to be a praying church. See, we serve a missionary God, and so we've got to worship that missionary God. We've got to turn to him in prayer. And, of course, I, I love the fact that Satan tries to use violence and fear to paralyze the disciples, to make them stationary, not missionaries. I, I, you know, it's so interesting how coronavirus has paralyzed people. And it's, you, you just see the Bible. They killed James, and I'm sure that paralyzed everyone. Uh-oh, we can't do anything. If we do something, maybe we're going to get killed. Satan has always tried to use fear to paralyze God's people. Violence to paralyze God's people. And sometimes your only weapon is the only weapon. And it's your strongest weapon, <laughs> the weapon called prayer. Now, of course, this is it's entitled the miraculous escape from prison. You know, I think there's this, there's, there's, we, we got three that are going to make the escape from prison today and get baptized. But I'm so inspired by our sister in Birmingham. She's made, dare we say, a miraculous escape from prison. You say, prison? Yeah, the prison of her mind. See, she was living as a man for several years. Steroids. She'd even gone through surgery. She'd even gone through things to make her appear physically just like a man. Well, she studied the Bible. She understood her calling. She understood she serves a missionary God, that maybe God has a mission for her. And not only did she study the Bible, repent of her sin. She's now a sister in the Lord. She's escaped the prison, and now she's an advocate to tell all those in the transgender community, come back to your true identity. Come back to who you are. I'm out of that prison. I've had the miraculous escape out of the prison of my mind. You can get out of your mind, get into the word of God, and be used as a missionary to the LGBT. Let God be true. Our God is true, and that is a miracle. And yet we see right here, uh, it's crazy because wickedness is winning. Uh, it's always winning. It's interesting. You know, Peter is, 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 is in jail. James gets killed. Wickedness is winning. But by the end, of, and Herod's on fire. But by the end of this chapter, Peter's out of jail. Wickedness isn't winning. And Herod gets killed. <laughs> God always gets the victory. 
And uh, I, I'm so encouraged about the victories we've had in the church. And I, I just love the fact that Peter is, I mean, I, I don't know if he caught that. It's just, it's, he's getting ready. Peter knew he was, he's, okay, I'm going to die tomorrow. I think I'll just take a nap. <laughs> Can you sleep at night? Peter slept, knowing that the next day Herod was probably going to kill him. He slept. The Bible says in verse 6, the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping. Between. I, I don't know. I mean, if you knew you were going to die the next day, you wouldn't be sleeping. I mean, but Peter was sleeping. You know, so interesting, faith, failure is not fatal. The last time Peter had a sleeping moment, he was sleeping at the cross with Jesus. He was in the courtyard of cowardice where Jesus was dying on the cross and, he was, and, and the disciples were falling asleep. And so he fell asleep because he had no faith. You know, when you don't have faith, you get sleepy. When you don't have faith, you get tired for no reason. Even David says, sin has sapped my strength as in the heat of the day. <laughs> you can actually get tired because you have no faith. And yet right here we see he's not sleeping because he has no faith. He's sleeping because he's got great faith. He knows that if his head gets cut off, he's going to be in glory with Jesus the next day. He knows that if he dies, he's served his purposes and he's done everything as a missionary to show himself a man approved by God. He knows he's given us. This convicted me. I know there's so much more I got to do. But Peter is sleeping. Can you sleep at night? Are you at peace in the prison of God's discipline? He's in the prison, <laughs> but he's at peace. <laughs> you know? And I'm sure he thought of his God. I'm sure he thought of Jesus. 24 hours before Jesus died, what was he doing? Washing feet, serving others. And so, so, so Peter is at pr peace. You know, some of us are at peace in the prison of darkness. We feel good about the prison of darkness. And this should not be a place where we find peace. Living in Europe, one of the most wicked sins I see here is people are in the prison of their mind. It, it, it is a dangerous thing to be in the prison of your thoughts. Well, the Bible says, do not be conformed by the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind through the word of God. What got Peter through this situation? It wasn't just that he saw Jesus. What got Peter through this situation? I'm sure you want to know. Look at John chapter 21. John chapter 21, verse 18. Very truly, I tell you. When you were younger, you dressed yourselves, and you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand, and someone else will dress you and lead you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. See, what gave Peter peace at night was the word of God. He said, I'm not an old man. Jesus told me I'm going to live to be an old man. Jesus told me I'm going to, I'm a missionary. And even though I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, Jesus is with me. His spirit is with me. You go through the book of Acts, you see the Holy Spirit's all over it. And the Holy Spirit was with Peter that night. And so he went to sleep because of his, his trust in the word of God. He remembered the promise that Jesus gave him that said, you're going to be old. And he sat there and he went, I'm not old yet. I'm good. I don't know how God's going to do it. I'm just going to go to sleep and pray and just know God is with me. See, what was ordinary? To know the word of God. What was ordinary? To pray. Do you believe in the promises of God? I mean, that was a promise that Peter had. Do you believe in Isaiah 40, verse 31? It says, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Do you believe in Proverbs 3, verse 5 through 6, that if you trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding in all your ways, uh, acknowledge him. Do you believe he'll make your path straight? Do you believe that in John 15, verse 5, it says, I am the vine. We are the branches. If we remain in him, we'll bear much fruit, showing ourselves to be disciples. It's to his glory. Do you believe in that promise? Do you believe in Mark chapter 11, verse 24, where it says, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe you've already received it <laughs> and it'll be yours. Do You believe that if you confess your sins, that he's faithful and he'll forgive you. Do you believe, not only do you make disciples, but if you teach them to obey everything that God has commanded you, that God is with you when you're teaching those new disciples to make disciples. See, what's so powerful is the church was earnestly 
praying for him. But look at this. This is hilarious. <laughs> it says the church was praying for him, right? And so we know Peter's gotten out. And it says in verse 12, it says, when this dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark. See, Mary, John's mother was, was a cranking rich girl, or rich woman, rather. I think she was probably a, a widow. His father's never mentioned very much. And so she's got house church there. <laughs> and so it says, where many people had gathered where they were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so over, <laughs> overjoyed, she ran back without opening it, claiming, Peter's at the door. <laughs> I mean, can you see his sister? Peter's like, I just escaped death. And he's knocking at the door. She's like, is that you, Peter? Yeah. Okay. And she just goes back into the house. <laughs> I mean, the miracle's right at the door. But she goes right back on in. She describes to the brothers, and the Bible just says in verse 16, but Peter kept knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet. He's like, I don't want to get killed, guys. <laughs> and he described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the brothers about this. He said to them, and then he left another place. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had come to Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him, he didn't find him. He cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Sixteen guys got killed for one man's pride. Sixteen people died. When we do what's ordinary, God can do what's extraordinary. Peter's at the door. You know, sometimes the answer to your prayer is at the front door. And it's the people of God who won't let the miracles on in. It was a miracle. But she was so overjoyed, didn't let him on in. They even disciple her on it, I believe. <laughs> I mean, they, they, they said uh, they were praying, and uh, it says in verse 15, you're out of your mind, they told her, when she kept insisting that it was so. They said, it must be an angel. What about an avenging angel? What about an angel that can destroy 185,000? They had the Old Testament. We can be so religious. We can be so religious. What if it was a guardian angel? Matthew chapter 18, verse 10. <laughs> An angel can kill 185,000. You know, you got to ask yourself, are you blocking the miracles with your unbelief? Your religious activity, but unbelief. I mean, they're doing the right thing, but they didn't believe. It took an extraordinary miracle to get him out of jail. But ordinary unbelief kept the miracle out of the house of God. It took a miracle to get him out of jail. But ordinary unbelief, yeah, we, it's probably, he's probably not, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and so when we do what's ordinary, God can do that which is extraordinary. So I'm so proud of one of my best friends, Raul. He gets wind that his father is dying and is very old. He leaves Sao Paulo, Brazil, just to go be with his dad knowing that this could be it. He studies the Bible with his, his, his dad. He starts talking to his dad about the gospel. And it was so encouraging. Last night, he baptized his dad. <laughs> and this has been such a lifelong memory or a lifelong goal for him. I mean, how much more so do we want to see our parents in the Lord? You know, when I look at Herod here, one stubborn man, one stubborn man. And the Bible says he resisted God. This story highlights the stupidity of resisting God. You say, well, why? Well, look at verse 23. It says, immediately because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down. You know, it's so funny. Prayer got, an angel uh, got, got, got Peter out of prison, but it was prayer that got that angel out of heaven. Got that angel out of heaven to go deal. And so the angel's there, and it says, the angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to increase and spread. Why? Because God is a missionary God. Is that not awesome? I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to pray. I want to challenge you to have a prayer list. I want to challenge you to have that prayer list and check off the prayers that God answers. See, God hasn't closed churches. He's opened churches in every home around the globe because God is a missionary God. We forget. We think he's a stationary God. No, he's a missionary God. 
and he's out to change the entire world. Point number two, geographic expansion and numeric increase. He's a missionary God because he wants geographic expansion and numeric increase. Chapter 13, verse 1. It says in the church at Antioch, there are prophets and teachers. Barnabas called uh, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger. Niger is the word that we, we, we've known called Nigeria. <laughs> so all the Nigerians out there, hey, isn't it awesome? You made the Bible. <laughs> and it says Lucius from Cyrene. That's Africa as well. That's northern Africa. Manan, who'd been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. I mean, this is a guy who, this isn't the Herod that just got killed. This is the Herod that uh, killed John the Baptist in the, in, in the, in the Gospels. Uh, and so this is, there we say, the cousin. It says Herod the Tetrarch. So you can grow up in a godless household. It doesn't matter about your household. You can choose to follow a missionary God once the mission comes to the heart of your soul. You can say, I know my, my parents hated God and killed Christians, but I want to become a disciple. And this is what fires me up about so many of the disciples. We've got a young lady by the name of Rachel. She's a true English girl. She didn't have any faith in God, but she's got faith now. She's a disciple. we got an awesome guy named Luke Snow. He was an atheist, but I almost don't want to believe him. He can be religious nowadays sometimes. Like, you weren't an atheist. you got deep convictions. Know your Bible. You sure you're telling me the truth right here? But he's a sold-out disciple, and he wants to be a missionary. See, this was a guy who grew up in a household without God, but yet he became one of the top leaders in Antioch. Now, we remember the church in Jerusalem is the mother church, but it was the church in Antioch that was the missionary church. And so we see here, it says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, now, what's the Holy Spirit saying to you? The Holy Spirit said, <laughs> Holy Spirit talks. <laughs> you know, sometimes the Holy Spirit speaks to us in a sermon like this. He says stuff that's not even in the sermon. And if we really want to be missionaries, we'll answer. He says, the Holy Spirit said, <laughs> says, set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. So after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. This is where the mission takes off right here. Things start going. They, 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 you know, many people believe the church is supposed to be a stationary community church. That is not the church of the Bible. The church is not a community church because if you have a community vision, all you'll win is maybe the neighborhood. But if you have a world vision, not only will you win the neighborhood, the community, the city, you will win the world for Christ. And you will be in the heart of God because God always has had the heart of a missionary. He sent Jesus to this earth. He sent his very best intern, Jesus Christ. He sent him down so that we can go up. Can you imagine if he never sent Jesus? Where would we be? Where would we be? And yet here in Europe, God desires geographic expansion and numeric increase. I'm so encouraged. We're going to get to the scripture. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm encouraged about the fact that we're going to be sending out uh, our, our, our church in Madrid, Spain. We're going to be sending out our church in Scotland. We're going to be sending out Dublin, Ireland. I don't know who's going to go to Dublin, Ireland, but I got my eye on, on, on a few. I got my eye on a few right there. And I know if I got my eye on a few, God's got his eye on several many more. We're going to Germany. We're going because God is a missionary God. It's an incredible thing to think about the fact that God sent his only intern, Jesus, and yet we got to send our best for the mission of God. See, when you're at work with what you know to do about God, God will give you more to do. When you're at work with what you know to do about God, God will give you more to do. And so they're worshiping and they're praying. That's what we know to do. That's an ordinary thing. I love the fact that things happen because they were worshiping. They were worshiping and praying. It says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit. You know, you want to get the Holy Spirit to talk to you? Worship. Fast. And God will speak to you. And of course, we see the, the, incredible, the incredible leadership here. You got, you got a, a, again, you got, you got a black guy right here, the Nigerian guy. You got a light skin, you got, you got dark skin brother and a light skin brother, okay? You got the, the guy from Niger, is, 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 it literally means dark skin right there. And then you got Lucius from Cy Cyrene, that's northern Africa, okay? And this is probably the guy that they forced to carry the cross. See, some disciples, you can't ask them to become disciples, you got to force them. Matthew chapter 27, verse 32. Uh, then you had Manane that we just described. He was the guy, the foster kid of Herod who killed John the Baptist. And then you have Barnabas and Saul right here. You have such a diverse leadership. I'm so 
encouraged by our church worldwide. We don't believe in a church of all one nation. Why? Because God doesn't believe in that. All white church is not in the heart of God. All black church is not the heart of God. All Asian church, that is not the heart of God. God desires it all nations. And so he's got this diverse leadership team right here. And the Bible says in verse 6, um, in verse 4, we pick it up. It says, the two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit. So who did the Holy Spirit send? Just the two of them. It says, they went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of the God in the Jewish synagogue. John was with them as their helper. Uh-oh, God didn't tell you to take an intern. <laughs> Paul and Barnabas were set aside, but they take John. Amen. It says, they traveled through the whole uh, island till they come to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer, a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. Bar-Jesus means son of Jesus. Luke, the doctor, says, I'm not even going to say son of Jesus. He's Bar-Jesus. <laughs> He's a fake Jesus. He's not the real deal. He is not the son of Jesus. It says, they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. Proconsul uh, was an intelligent man. He sent for Barnabas and Saul. You'll notice the leadership right there. It's Barnabas, then Saul. The things are going to change a little bit later on. It says, they sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimus the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul. Notice Saul, who was called Paul. <laughs> one's Hebrew, one's, one's Greek. A lot of people think it changed. It didn't. It's just two different names. It says, Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus and said, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that's right. I wonder how that go down nowadays. <laughs> you get someone teaching false doctrine and you go, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that's right. <laughs> that's the sad state of the world, that we want to be more politically correct than biblically correct. You know, if you're teaching a gospel that doesn't match with the Bible, you, you are what the Bible says here. A child of the devil and an enemy of everything that's right. How do we know what's right? The word of God is what's right. John chapter 17, verse 17 says the word of God is truth. And then he says, well, you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord. Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You're going to be blind, and for a time you'll be unable to see. And, of course, he gets blinded. He gets totally, 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 totally. Uh, the pro council sees it. He's amazed about the teaching of the Lord. Verse 13, it says, from Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga and Pamphylia. And then it says, where John left him and returned to Jerusalem. Of course, this is John who wrote the apostle or the book of Mark, John Mark. So they go 100 miles north, and the Bible says John left him. You know what's interesting? When you look right here, it says John left him. The Greek word is akparto. It means he left. <laughs> okay, he just left. Later on, when you look at Acts chapter 15, verse 38, it says John or uh, John Mark deserted them. It's the word aphistomy. It means to revolt, to rebel, to fall away. So he didn't just leave them. He fell away from the mission team. <laughs> Why? Because you see the shift. You see the shift in leadership. It says Paul and his companions. <laughs> right? It doesn't say Barnabas and Saul. <laughs> it says Paul. Now Paul is taking over leadership. A lot of different reasons why John Mark left the ministry. Some believe it was because he was a spoiled mama's boy. The church met in his mother's home, and some believe he was homesick. And once he traveled those 100 miles north to get to Paphos, he was so used to having everything given to him, he didn't want to work to be in the ministry. And on top of that, he was never called or set apart. So there's a little discipling right there. Some believe that it was the coronavirus. Not coronavirus, but malaria. <laughs> uh, this was huge in this city. Paul the apostle himself says, hey, he got malaria when he was there. It was because of an illness that he went and preached to them in Galatians, I believe it's chapter 4. Some believe, hey, that stopped him. Sometimes the coronavirus, a virus can stop you from the mission, from being about God's purpose. You'll be more afraid of the virus than the virus of fear spreading through your heart, stopping people from knowing God. Some believe it was that. Some believe he just ran from adversity. Some believe he was just a style warrior. You know what style warriors are, right? Oh, I only can be a part of a church that's my style. Paul is so hard line, always challenging me. I want a softer cotton candy, sweet kind of message to tell me how awesome I am. In fact, Michael, I don't like you. You're just always calling me to change. You're always challenging me. You're this, you're that. You know, when I read my Bible, it's, it, I, get, I feel like that a lot. <laughs> it's always challenging what I think and pulling me back. Some believe he just didn't like that strong message that Paul the Apostle preached, and he left the mission team right there. The Bible says... 
On the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. After reading from the law, the prophets, the synagogue rulers, sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a message of encouragement for the people, speak it. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hands, and he gives his very first sermon right here. He says, Men of Israel, you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God, the people of Israel, chose our fathers. He goes old school history. He made the people. I mean, you get all the things he's saying. Right? He made the people prosper during the stay of Egypt. The mighty power. He led them out of that country. He endured their conduct for about 40 years. In the day. He overthrew seven nations. I mean, God is such a missionary God. You see his action right there <laughs> in Canaan and gave their land to the people as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. Paul concludes this sermon by quoting Psalm chapter one or chapter 16, verse 10, down in verse 35. Then he quotes Habakkuk chapter one, verse five, where it talks about, hey, you won't believe it. Even if I told you that I'm going to do something incredible. And then you see the shift in leadership, which I think was one of the issues that really got John Mark. It says in verse 42, Paul and Barnabas. First, it was Paul and his companions. Now, Luke just nails it. He says, Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue. The people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When, when the congregation dismissed, many of the Jews and the devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. I want to go back to this John Mark theme. Are you a style warrior? Are you someone unwilling to do the hard work? Are you someone who lets adversity stop you? Are you someone who says, you know, I just don't like their style? You know, Jesus had that issue. He says, hey, we sang a dirge. That didn't work. We played a flute. That didn't work. It's never about style. It's never about style. Jesus, the perfect preacher, had people saying, I don't like your style. They didn't like him so much they killed him. You know, if you don't like the style of the scriptures, the scriptures don't have a problem. You do. You say, well, who felt that way? Me. <laughs> I, I feel that way on a daily basis. But I've learned to embrace change because I know God is on a mission. See, God is a missionary God. He's trying to get the word around the world. And sometimes the best place to start is the heart. The best place to start is the Christian heart. I mean, disciples. How many of you are ready to go on a mission? How many of you want to saturate? You know, the problem isn't saturation. The problem is when people aren't sent. We've been saturated with the gospel. Now it's time for us to be sent. It's time for us to send out churches. And Paul is just laying it on out. And he's really calling everybody to accept the word of God. It says in verse 52, it says the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Chapter 14, 47 AD, we're now in Asia Minor. It says at Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles but I love the Holy Spirit adds the word effective. It says a, a bunch of Jews and Gentiles believe. Same message converted both types of people. It says, but the Jews who refuse to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. You know, we get a lot of people that try to poison the minds against people studying the Bible. We've even had people here in London try and stop people wanting to be baptized. Say, oh, you guys are a cult. You guys are this. You guys are that. <laughs> and yet it's so encouraging the three that have come today. Who, who, dare we say, a few of them have had their minds poisoned or attempted to poison. It says, I don't want that poison. I want Jesus. I want to be a missionary, and they're being baptized today. But you see that being mind poisoned was something that happened back then. It will happen today. It says, the Jews refused to believe and stirred up Gentiles, poisoned their minds against the brothers. Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were Divided. Some sided with the Jews, others sided with the apostles. There was a plot among the Gentiles and the Jews together with their leaders to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to Lyconium, cities of Lystra and Derbia and the surrounding country where they continued to preach the good news. Verse 8. Now they get to the Roman province of Galatia. It says in Lystra there sat a man crippled at his feet who was lame from birth. He had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him and saw he had faith to be healed. <laughs> Sometimes faith can be seen of the, in the eyes. 
Sometimes you look a person in the eye and you can tell if they don't want to be bitter anymore. You can tell if they want to give up their criticism. You can tell if they don't want to be apathetic but evangelistic. You can tell they don't want to be stationary. They want to be a missionary. I so love a young man by the name of Sulo. <laughs> He's got that look in his eyes. He kind of does like, you just see in his eyes, he wants to do something great for God. Of course, this man right here, they preach the word of God to him. They challenge him. He begins to walk. He stands on up. They try to worship Paul and, and the preacher right here, something that we see on the Internet all day long. Preachers love to be worshipped. If you worship me, you, you, I'm, I'm the wrong preacher to worship. <laughs> you need to worship the God that you hear me talking about. Uh, and then, of course, the Bible says he tried to challenge them not to the, the, Paul and, uh, and, 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 and the brothers right there, Paul and Barnabas, they say, hey, don't worship us. Even with that, they still got man-focused. But the Bible says in verse 19, then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconum, won the crown over. They stoned Paul, dragged him out of the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, they probably prayed, just like for Peter, he got up, fell away, because I, I, don't, I can't believe God, all these things that have happened to me as I've become a disciple. No. He got up, went back into the city. <laughs> but the next day, he left for Derby. <laughs> you got to be tough to be a missionary. You got to be tough. You got to be tough. See, for us to have geographic expansion, numeric increase, and you see it here, we've got to be tough. We've got to be disciples who are tough. Of course, if we're going to have geographic expansion, we've got to have accountability. It says in verse 27, on arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles and they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Is that not awesome? There's a little bit of accountability. I love accountability when I have numbers. I hate it when I don't. <laughs> you know, it's not about numbers. Well, it kind of is. There's a whole book in the Bible called Numbers. <laughs> it's not about numbers. Can you imagine if you were part of the 3,000 and the Bible just says, and a bunch of people got baptized? No, 3,000 got baptized. It's not about numbers. It is about numbers in some sense. It's about how many churches we plant. It's about how many people we baptize. It's about how many studies you were in this week. It's about how long you prayed. It is about numbers do tell, not all the story, but numbers do tell a story. If we're going to have geographic expansion, we need accountability, brothers and sisters. We need accountability. It's not that... We, we just do it just because we, we, we got to do it. No, we want to see numbers of people. We want to see so many people become disciples. Do, do, do you have this vision? Paul and Barnabas, they're just going after it. Geographic expansion. You see the word going to Turkey and spreading all out. We get to chapter 21 or, or, verse, uh, 14, or chapter 14, verse or chapter 15, verse 1, it says, Some men came down from Judah and Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you're circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you can't be saved. And, of course, this is a challenge. Paul and Barnabas go into a huge, uh, huge meeting. They have to go and get the apostles. Uh, they have to settle this dispute. Dare we say this is the, arguably the first church split that could happen roughly about 20 years into the church planting right there. So they go there. They say, hey, listen, guys, we're not going to make the Gentiles get circumcised. And a lot of people believe a, different, a few different things. I think the Jews were calling them to be circumcised because they were seeing that there was a lot of Gentiles becoming disciples, and they were losing the influence of the movement. And so now look at all these Gentiles. Whoa, whoa, whoa I'm becoming old. I'm getting this. I'm no longer the cool guy anymore. <laughs> these Gentiles, you got to be circumcised, all right? <laughs> and so, of course, James solidifies central leadership, and he calls for unity and forceful advancement. He goes, guys, it's my decision. This is what we're going to do. We believe in central leadership. There's only going to be one way we're going to continue to get issues like this dealt with. It's the same way they did it in the Bible through central leadership. You need one man that says, hey, you want to go to Nando's, you want to McDonald's, we're not going to either, we're going to eat at home. <laughs> James makes that decision in chapter 15. He brings unity, which is what central leadership brings. He brings unity to the church, and they go on preaching the word of God. But in chapter 15 and verse 36, it says sometime later, Paul and Barnabas, doesn't tell us how long, but sometime later, Paul and Barnabas said, let us go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. They believed in follow-up. <laughs> they believed in follow-up. If we're going to have geographic expansion, we've got to follow up and find out how many of the disciples that have been baptized have baptized. <laughs> how many of the disciples that have been baptized are sharing their faith? 
He says, let's find out how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark. Mark had a problem with running away. If you look at the gospel of Mark, Mark ran away, sadly, with no clothes on. <laughs> Many believe that's, that's, that's Mark. So I'm sure Paul remembered that or knew about that story. Mark left them on the mission team. I'm sure Paul knew about that story. And then the Bible just says, but Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them. Remember the Greek word there, he fell away. <laughs> he fell away from them in Pamphylia not continuing to work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas. And, and where was Silas? Silas was at the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. You kind of graze over him. But Silas has been there, so he's not just somebody who appears on the pages. He was there. Paul chose Silas, a guy who had been at one of the crucial moments of the kingdom of God. He chose Silas and left commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord, went through Caesarea, Sicilia, geographic expansion, strengthening the churches. And we stop right there. You know, there are many, it was, for me, it's very clear. There, there were books and comments. I was reading this and so many people, we, there, we, two different styles. There's just two different styles. Barnabas did such a great job. Paul was just too focused. We don't know who was right or wrong. You know, I just look at the word of God and let the Bible tell me who's right. The Bible says very clearly, Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left commended. Keyword, Barnabas wasn't commended for what he did. Paul was. And yes, Barnabas' encouragement over the course of years became a source of awesomeness for Paul because later on, 10 years later on, it was a great thing for Paul to say, hey, send John Mark to be with me. But just like the encouragement John Mark got from Barnabas worked, the truth of God's word sat in his heart when Paul says, you're out of ministry <laughs> until you learn not to give up. Also, you know the fact that Barnabas had distanced himself from the Gentiles. Even Peter had distanced himself. And it was Paul the apostle who had had the disciple, his, dare we say, older brother in the Lord right there, Barnabas, on doing that in the book of Galatians. And so Paul knew all this and says, no, we've got to have guys that really want to see the mission that are sold out, that do not quit, do not give up. And so he chose a new son, and God gave him a new vision, which is our last point. It says this here. Verse 1. He came to Derby and Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. You know, that's an awesome thing to ask yourself. Are you spoken well of in two churches? Are you spoken well of in two different leadership styles? Are you spoken well of under two different Bible talks? I mean, does the evangelist speak well of you and the shepherd? <laughs> right? Are you spoken well of? This is awesome. Timothy was spoken well of uh, by, by, by two different churches. It says in verse 3, Paul wanted to take him along for the journey, so he circumcised. I mean, this is hilarious. He just gets through arguing. Hey, we don't need to be circumcised. Then he comes down here and says, bro, you got to get circumcised. <laughs> See, they tried to make it a biblical thing in Acts chapter 15. But all scripture is useful for teaching, rebuking, and correcting. And so Paul goes, mm, it isn't a thing where you got to do it, but this is a disputable matter, and it will block the geographic expansion, and it will block the, the, the numeric increase if you don't show a relatability to these Jews right here and get circumcised. By the way, I know Luke the doctor is going to write this account, but I got to do it. I, I got to ask you. Will you let someone circumcise you? What does that mean? Will you let someone cut away the things that are not, that are not biblical? They're just things in your life that will stop you from being effective. I'll never forget one of the most challenging talks I had with my father in the faith, Kip McKean. I was as nervous as a man. Uh, I, I was nervous. <laughs> just put it that way. And he sat me down, looked me dead in the eyes, says, Michael, I got something very serious to tell you. Stop biting your nails. That's it. <laughs> I, I almost got a bit of an attitude. And then he, like, he goes, no one wants to follow a preacher that's up there chewing on his nails. You got to stop that. Gotta cut that out, man. You got to be a man of God. You know, we live in a generation where nobody wants to change who they are. 
Everybody says, this is who I am. And you'll never be radically used by God. You'll never be a Timothy. If you don't allow those things to be cut out of your life, that stops your influence on the gospel. And so I'm a Londoner now. I've got my London flat. I've got my London insurance card. I'm going to get my British license. And I've said in it more than I think I probably should say, I think I'm now a Londoner. You know, this is powerful because he allowed Paul to be a spiritual father. See, we will never evangelize all of Europe if the men and women don't get adopted. If the men don't say, you're my dad. You're my mom. I've got to ask you, for the members of the London International Christian Church, who's your spiritual dad? Are, are you... You have something in your heart that's blocking someone from. Paul says, hey, you don't have many fathers, but I became your father through the gospel. He has to remind the church, hey, I kind of you probably wouldn't be saved if I didn't plant the church. You know, I, I got to lift up everybody who sent me a, a happy birthday. <laughs> um, it, it, it brought me to tears. You say, why did it bring you to tears? I haven't celebrated a birthday with my physical family since I was about 12 and a half, 13 years old. I've celebrated more birthdays in the kingdom than in my physical life. And when I think about all the spiritual sons, some days I have sad days when I think about my mother not making it. But what wakes me up are my spiritual sons and daughters. I think about Frank in Birmingham, taking that great church from 11 and growing it to over 42 now. And it gets me up. I think about young son, Luke Snow, how he's embraced me as a dad, given up atheism, and is going after building the kingdom. I think about Dom. I think about so many. I think about Kobe Gray. We've had some circumcision moments. <laughs> so Kobe, I'm cutting that off. But he's one of the most incredible speakers, gifted orators, loyal sons that I have. And what can I say about the daughters? So many, too many to name. i, I got to ask you. Have you been adopted? Timothy let himself get adopted. This has got to be our family, brothers and sisters. This has got to, you, you, you got to say, you're, you're my spiritual dad. You're my spiritual mom. I want to be that new son. That's in the kingdom. But how much more so do we need to go out there and get new sons? Remember, the point is new sons, new vision. <laughs> we need new sons and new daughters and new visions if we're going to be following God who is a missionary. So we need several people baptized. And so what happens here after he chooses him? It says in verse 6, Paul and his companions travel through the region of Figueroa. Remember, Luke's writing this. And, and to the region of Figueroa and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus wouldn't let them. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas during the night. Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia, that's Europe, standing and begging him, come over to Europe, come over to Europe, come over to Europe. What does the come over to Europe sound like? It says, come over to Europe and help us. What does that sound like here in London? It sounds like this, there is no God. That's a cry for help. It sounds like this, don't enforce your views on me. No, that means, that, that's, that's, don't be faked out, disciples. Right here, the scriptures teach the Macedonian man says, come over to help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them, and we stop right there. It's so incredible. God blocks Paul from going to Asia because he needs to go to Europe. You know, it's so amazing. I remember selling everything and coming to Europe for the gospel. See, I thought it was God's plan for me to be in L.A. <laughs> God says, no, it's, your, it's my plan for you to go to London. Your wife is British, and you've got to evangelize all of Europe. And this vision is so encouraging. It says Paul and his companions. But at the end of it, it says we got ready. See, Luke wasn't one of the mission team members in the beginning. But by the end of the vision, he joined the mission team. Why? He saw that God was a missionary. Now, once you get to chapter 17, the Bible says that Paul and uh, 
It says, when they pass through Amphiphilosia or Amphiphilus, when they, remember Luke's writing this, so most likely Luke became the leader of the church at Philippi, but he went on a mission here. I just got to ask you, has the coronavirus given you a chance to have a new vision? Has the coronavirus given you a chance to have a new vision? One that God wants, a God vision. I want to be on that mission team. I want to raise up. I want, I, want, I want a new son. I want to learn what it feels like to have a spiritual son, a spiritual daughter. I want to adopt in the church. I don't want to grow old and stationary. I want to be a missionary. I want to, I want to, gra- I want to, I want to grab these young people and, and, and pour everything I've learned into them, much like Barnabas did. Of course, Barnabas, he didn't make the right decision right there. But w- we've just got to have new sons and new vision. We've got to let the coronavirus help us to have New hope, new churches, new dreams, new evangelists, new converts, new remnant brothers and sisters coming to join us. See, God has always been a missionary. He is not a stationary God. He is a missionary God. And let us get new sons and new vision so that we can see God's vision in our generation. To God be all the glory. Wow, thank you so much. We're going to be singing Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, His army shall he lead Till every foe is vanquished And Christ is Lord indeed Stand up, stand up for Jesus Ye soldiers of the cross Lift high his royal banner It must not suffer loss From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Wow, we serve a missionary God. I'm so grateful that Michael is going through the book of Acts. You know, it, it brings me back to kind of English childhood memories where you've got King Arthur with his, with his 12 knights around him. I don't think there's actually 12, I don't know, but it reminds me of the apostles. And they're going throughout all of these different places and, and, and then they're, just, they're just killing darkness all over England. This, this takes me back to that kind of hand in the sword kind of Englishness. And I've got to be honest, I'm... I haven't been that English man. <laughs> I have not been that English man. And this, this sermon has really, really helped me today to, to understand that the call for England is, is immense. The call for England is huge. I've really learned that, that as English people, we need, to, we need to go and get it. We need to go and get it. I think one cardinal sin for, for me as an English man is, is not being confrontational and really understanding that, you know, the same fear that John Mark had to make him run away from the mission, and the same fear that Luke had that he... he wasn't quite there until he was sold out and joined the mission team. That's the exact same fear that I had being English and, and not wanting to, to change who I was and really submit to the gospel. But a point that really hit me about Michael's message was that God can do extraordinary things with our ordinary things. And honestly, all it took for me was to read the book of John and to say a little prayer. And then I was like, I guess God is true. (laughs) I guess God is real. And then I got a hunger and hunger and hunger and hunger. And before long, atheism was out the window. And now I am serving full time in in the church. And God has completely changed my life. Not only do I want to go to Ireland. Yes, I know Michael was speaking to me. But I want to see churches planted across the whole of the UK. In Wales, in Scotland. Even going to pokey little places like Devon and Leicester. No no offense, Frankie. We go into all the different places in the UK. I just want to see English people come to God. I don't know, Frankie, what did you think about it? 
Oh, I just thought it was amazing. We serve a missionary God. I think what really spoke to my heart was how Peter really embraced change. Um, and if, we, if we're called to change, we can either run, we can resist, or we can embrace the change. Mm. And honestly, following God, I've chosen to embrace that change through prayer. Um, and I can see in Europe, especially England, that we don't often want to change. Um, but honestly, through changing, through taking out everything in my life which isn't biblical, I can see that God's transformed my heart. And I have a heart now um, for a missionary God. That's the, mm. that's the God that we serve. He wants us to expand. Um, and I'm just so grateful that we're now a family. We're a spiritual family. And all that God wants is for us to expand and have more daughters, more sons, uh, more fathers, more mothers in God's kingdom. Uh, so I, I loved the lesson. It really spoke to my heart. And all I want to do is to um, build God's, God's church and to have more daughters in my life. So please, if you want to study the Bible, uh, contact us and we would love to study with you. Absolutely. And we're, we're calling all you, we're calling you and you and you, especially <laughs> my uncle, my dad, all those other grumpy Englishmen that don't want to come to Jesus. You've got to come with us. We're going to be back here in, in uh, next Sunday. We're going to have our 10 a.m. church service. We want to invite you guys down. This is the most incredible thing that has happened in both of our lives, and we just want to invite other people to come and enjoy it too. We, we love you guys. Thank you so much for joining us today. See you guys later. Amen. Let's all rise and say, go and make disciples. Well, he said, he said to go to every nation. He said, he said to everyone. Well, he said, he said to make them to the side. And then, and then the job will then be done. Jesus done. said, go and make disciples of all nations. And then, and then them in my name. Well, teach them. Tell me when, Jamie. Okay. So, guys, thank you for the meeting. Uh, really appreciate you guys' time and sacrifice. Very productive as usual. I do want to ask you to pray for John. He's been studying the Bible super eager. But he got involved in a terrible accident yesterday. He lost his left arm. They had to amputate it. Uh, but when I called him, he said not to worry. He was all right. He was all right. You get it? All right? You know? You know? I'm going to tell Michael. Michael's going to share that joke. It's a good one. Uh, no, I don't think I don't think Michael's gonna enjoy that, bro. I don't think he's gonna enjoy that. But I got a better one though. Okay, go uh, ahead. I got a better one. Uh, I heard there's a restaurant that just opened in town called Karma. You said Karma? Karma, yeah. Okay. Apparently they have no menu because you get what you deserve. Oh. Okay, it's an improvement. It's an improvement. But let, let me tell you the joke that you need to share, okay? And this will help you with the mystery of marriage as well. So my wife asked me for a chapstick and I gave her a glue stick and now she won't speak to me.
<laughs> okay. <laughs> but, brothers, please. I mean, li- listen, you know, um, it's got to be something relatable. Mike loves reading. He loves reading books. How about this one? I- I've been reading this great book on anti-gravity. Uh, trouble is, I can't put it down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And, and those jokes are better than mine. Listen, guys, uh, let's just all be humble. You know, I, I know I lead in humility. Uh, just take my joke as the best, okay? I'm just kidding. Love you guys. <laughs> Have a great day. Bye-bye. Love you guys. See ya. <laughs>